And we're on. Sam Wellsby, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. I found you on Instagram somehow. Your, your podcast is called True Tales of Enlightenment. It is. It's a bit of a mouthful, but yeah, True Tales of Enlightenment. Yeah, that, and that sounded uh, really cool to me. It's something that I um, really value it, is to hear people's direct experience and not just uh, repeating what was in some book. Like a lot of yoga books that are new are just like the yoga books from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And uh, like we were talking about before the show, I mentioned that I used to have this Facebook group called Path Notes of the Skeptical Mystic. Yeah. And my idea was to find out what actually happened with you. Like what are your actual experiences? Not what you read somewhere and um, yeah. So your um, my sort of podcast, background. Yeah, your podcast name really um, resonated with me in that way. So tell us, like, how did you get started with the podcast? Why did you choose that name? So what's yeah. the background on that? Um, I think it's important to say that I was never really spiritual. So it's been a sort of, um, I started off mainly um, in sort of the world of psychology and I trained as a clinical hypnotherapist after having worked in, in uh, sales and marketing for years. And I was really interested in the mind. And I happened to meet a teacher who was also really into meditation, but she was also uh, an intuitive is how she described it. Um, and I was having a bit of a hard time. And so I would go to her for counseling sessions and not only would she give me hypnotherapy, but she would give me the first book that she gave me actually that helped was a book called Cutting the Ties That Bind by Phyllis Crystal. And that book is all about setting up a really short meditation where you're accessing um, higher consciousness. I think in the book they call it uh, a high C or something like that. Hmm. So I was doing these meditations like five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night just to try and get a bit of peace. I wasn't really thinking about connecting to anything spiritually. Um, and I just started to have these really strong spiritual experiences, really strong um, physical feelings within my body. I'd have these bliss states. I'd have these out of body experiences while I was sitting at work in my, uh, you know, at my desk. Um, and it started to sort of crack that shell of, it's not that I thought spirituality was nonsense. I didn't have a direct experience with it. So as soon as that started to happen, um, I just started to question everything. And it wasn't just about my own sort of spiritual ideas. It was about what's going on with my life. And not only my life, what's going on out in society. And I think it was about 2011 and some documentaries like Zeitgeist, you know, those sort of documentaries started to come out, which was all about, you know, what's going on in the banking system, what's going on politically, all of this sort of stuff sort of combined in this perfect storm. And uh, I decided to just leave everything and go on this. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I just decided to leave everything and, and go and try and figure things out. So while I was doing that, I was writing a lot. I was writing a blog mainly about my travels, but I started to, to sort of um, talk about what was going on in society. I was going on like protest marches. I was just having some really interesting experiences. And the idea was to write a book, but I didn't have a name for it or anything like that. Um, and I eventually ended up back in the UK where I met my partner who's Scottish and uh, I ended up moving up to Scotland. And it was when I moved up to Scotland that the story started to come together. The name True Tales of Enlightenment came to me. And then I started um, making little videos and, and, and started with the podcast, really. So the name, the name was just pure inspiration out of nowhere. But it made sense to me because talking about my direct experience because I don't really have any background to rely on. I was reading books, but as you say, they all sort of say the same thing. So it was really, I suppose, and still is a, uh, just me talking about my experiences and my thoughts and my opinions and, and always questioning things. 
um, questioning the status quo, whether it's to do with what's going on in the world or whether it's to do with spiritual teachings. Um, and I think that a lot of people are getting a bit sick of the same old, same old spiritual teachings, spiritual teachers, spiritual practices, because they're not seeing the results that they want. Um, I don't know if that's your experience. Um, yeah, pretty similar. We like reading through some of your stuff and um, listening to the bit that I that I have. Like one thing that you were that you talked about was uh, like getting out of the regular like nine to five kind of thing. And like, what would we be doing if we didn't have to spend so much time working to pay bills? Yes. And so I think about that a lot. Like I have. Um, I'm a, I do strength conditioning training. I teach like kids and adults and one-on-one um, -on -one sessions and classes. And that's like my, my passion. I, I love doing that stuff and doing the podcast. It's, um, it's what I really like to do, but I also have what I call my, my job job. Yeah. And I work from uh, five in the morning until one in the afternoon and then sometimes for overtime, I'll go in at three in the morning and work until one in the afternoon. Wow. I'll start my um, clients in, in the late afternoon um, and then into the evening. So I might not get done until about nine o'clock at night. And uh, it, it, all, it all works for me. I don't like complain. I'm not like stressed out in any kind of bad way. It's like this personal training and the, the fitness business can be up and down. So I, yeah. and you might have uh, maybe a day planned where you'll make, um, maybe you have a, a $300 day planned. You have like $300 worth of, and if you can do that all week, then everything's going really well. But maybe you have a few people cancel and that $300 day turns into a $100 day yeah. or maybe less. Or maybe you have the, a hundred and fifty dollar day planned and it ends up being a seventy five dollar day or something so that up and down uh, thing uh, can cause stress so my job job as I call it even yeah. though it's not my my passion I know with like just that it knocks out my bills and I don't have to worry about anything and then um, I don't plan on doing it forever yeah uh, but there is but like what you're talking about, like, what would you do if we weren't making, or if we weren't working to pay our bills? Yeah. And then you, so you go into the cabin. And so was it just like you had enough in savings that you didn't really have to worry? Or was it like a, a bit of a leap of? It was, a, it was a bit of both, to be honest. Like when I left Australia, so I'm, I'm from London originally, and then I emigrated to Australia when I was about 30. I stayed there for seven years, and then I took off again. So I'd saved enough money to do like maybe six months of traveling. Um, and I, I really didn't have a plan in mind. The perfect thing about coming up to the cabin was it was rent free hmm. because it belonged, well, it still does. It belongs to a friend of my partner. So, but I had originally moved up to Edinburgh, which is where he lived, which is like a major city in, in Scotland. And he was working, he's a musician, but he was doing his job job. He was being a plumber um, and I was trying to find work and it was all really depressing. And I'd, I'd made this big sort of leap of faith to go, I want to get out of this rat race, you know, and I'm going to find some new path. And then I found myself sort of back in the city again. I'm like, this is just ridiculous. Then he lost his job. He was made redundant. Mm. And I just had this feeling. I was like, we've got to get out of here and just give ourselves two months to just work out a new game plan. And so we just asked this friend, look, can we just come and stay in your place? Cause it's never used, he hasn't used it for five years. Sorry, it's my cat. Um, <laughs> this is why I don't do videos cause she's always, <laughs> she's always sitting here. Um, yeah, so we just planned to just take a, a two month break to just go into the wilderness and really sort of work out what we wanted to do. And two months turned into three years. Wow. And when we came here, it's a really rural place. So they've got a few log cabins. They've got a small village, which is where we live now. So we didn't know anyone. Um, go down, please. We didn't really know what existed here. 
but it turns out there's a community here and a chance meeting with a woman. Uh, I went for a run one morning and I just bumped into someone and she had just taken over. There's a community restaurant here and she was in a panic. She was like, oh God, I'm looking for people to come and work in the restaurant, which I've never done before in my life. And um, I just said, oh, I'll come and help you. And that was it. And so I've been working as a cook for like three years and that's my job job. We've got really, really low expenses. So I don't have to generate the amount of money that I had to generate when I was, you know, in my corporate job or whatever, paying hundreds of dollars a month in rent. And it just, it just gave us both space to be creative. So whether it's creative with music, creative with what I do, or you wanting to do something, whether it's a podcast or, or personal training, you need space to do that because the daily grind, the consciousness you get into in the daily grind is just survival mode. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to come up with all of this creative stuff when you're, when you're literally panicked about constantly finding money? It's not, um, it's not conducive to that. So I made the, yeah, I just made the decision to downsize my life and not worry so much a about what people thought about me, you know, or, or B about stuff that I wanted to buy and stuff that I used to distract myself with um, because I wasn't happy. And yeah, it was, it was a massive shift. Maybe it's not one that everyone would want to do because people like the sort of high life or they like a certain level of lifestyle. But I just feel so much freer. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because it's like, yeah, I, I want, I do want to make a lot of money. You know, I want the podcast to be like more and more successful, get, you know, advertising money or like um, more um, like on Patreon, people can um, contribute to, like, they can pay like a dollar a month. Yeah. And so you get enough people doing that because podcasts do, as you know, it, it takes time. Totally. <laughs> and, uh, an effort and there's like scheduling and there's it's there's a lot of work that goes into just like making this thing happen and I don't mind any of it it's not like any of it bothers me or but the being able to get to the point where all you do is what you want to do yeah and uh, we both listen to Joe Rogan and he talks about that a lot so he had um, he was an actor and uh, or well, and then like host of the show Fear Factor, yeah. And that show, he says, gave him um, f you money basically. So like yeah. after that show, he doesn't have to do anything that he doesn't want to do. And he started his podcast as just like a way to talk with his buddies and and just he wasn't expecting it to be this massive mm -hmm. thing that it's become, and. So, and it was through him that I, th I kind of encouraged me to try it out and, you know, starting off like not already famous, you don't you know, start off with, you know, a million followers or anything. It starts off with one or into the thousands over time or however, whatever we are, we are now. And, but to just be able to, uh, to do what we want is that that goal and there's something about like the like we talk about like the job job and like the, like the zen thing of um like chop wood carry water so when you know like your daily life like if there was no like bills to pay or anything like that like what would you be doing well you'd be chopping wood you'd be carrying water you'd be this is your life and this is what this is how you practice zen you know, with the right state of mind, you're not like cussing to yourself the whole time you're chopping wood and carrying water. Exactly. This is just what we're doing. And even in my, when I was thinking about this, I, I even realized that I combined my kids and adults strength and conditioning classes mm -hmm. at uh, White Pine Wilderness Academy where I teach. And I thought about it for a long time before I combined them. Uh, but in part of the, in some of the classes in the kids class, they were chopping wood and they were carrying water as exercises. And then, you know, I thought about like the Zen thing afterwards, like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ancient Zen master and I didn't <laughs> even know it. 
but when you're like going to your uh, job at, as a cook, mm-hmm. just like see it as like what what kind of restaurant is it, and like what's your state of mind? Do you kind of like dread going in, or do no, you, no, you- not at all. I mean, well, it, it's quite cool here because there's a really small community of about seventy people. Um, we're all very different. I'm not saying there's not sort of conflicts and all of that normal stuff that goes on with neighbours, but it's quite it's unusual because I grew up in a big city, but I know all of my neighbors and we know all of each other's business. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I work with basically friends of mine and the restaurant is just a, a community based restaurant. So if people come up and use the log cabins here for holidays or whatever, they've got someone to go and somewhere to go and have a, a pretty cheap and basic meal. Um, and it's not a job that I ever thought that I would do. And it's, it was sort of, a challenge, not particularly intellectually, I suppose, but like just a totally different challenge when you've got the, the pressure of like cooking 50 meals in like three hours. It's a, it totally does something to your brain. It's like a practical thing, which I wasn't used to. And it was, it was just great. It was just something totally different. Um, so it's, it's good. I only do it a few nights a week. And like, like I say, it's just one of those things that just pays the bills. And it's, it's a sort of enjoyable thing. And then the rest of the time I'm writing or doing podcasts or I also mentor people. So I've got clients mainly here and in Australia that I just see over Skype. So anyone who's sort of at that crossroads in their life where they're like, how am I going to get out of this life and go on to this? How am I going to take that leap of faith? without being so scared because most people are stopped by fear right what if I do this and I don't have any money or I don't have a pension or other people think I'm being crazy you know all these fears come up okay we're back on cool sorry I think it's probably my wi-fi because we're having a bit of a, a, a storm up here at the moment Yeah, so I think the trick in a way is to have lots of different things and to not take anything too seriously. You know, people get really sort of tunnel vision with their careers and what they think they should be doing, what's going to give them status or whatever. And it's like, why don't you just work as a cook for a bit or as a cab driver or just do some job, who cares, while you work on your dream? So that's that's what I help people with when they're coming and having mentoring with me. And I guess that's what I talk about on the podcast. Just, you know, whatever I'm doing during the week, whatever I'm looking at in the world, or if I'm struggling with something myself, then I'll talk about it. Just to give people a bit of meaningful content, I suppose. Hopefully. Yeah, what I've heard so far, I I, I really liked. And one of your um, posts, or I think more than one of them, but you were you just found a new uh, like forest that you hadn't been to before. So like, yeah. oh, I think my next podcast is going to be at this place. And you could hear the, the water in the background. And um, when you're, and then you mentioned um, uh, before we started recording that when you started the podcast, you got the fancy equipment and you got the, yeah. um, cause when you, if you're like me, when you started doing it, you're reading all kinds of, here's how you do it here's what you need um don't use anything less than this quality of a microphone yeah. here's how you so what do you think is the that makes you just like take your is it just like your phone that you're using yeah or, it's just my just my iphone and then so and you just, just use the voice voice recorder or whatever's on there and then so you just go out to the woods somewhere usually and like yeah i try i try and go outside it's not always possible because the weather can be a bit you know, wet up here, but I try to sit down with the, you know, special podcasting microphone and the special headphones and and all the rest of it and have my notes all written down. And, you know, it just came across as being quite stilted. You know what I mean? There was no flow. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was just an experiment to go out. I I can't remember the first one I did outside. I think it was about karma. That's right. And it wasn't supposed to be a podcast. I was just walking as I normally do. And I, I started to get some ideas. So it was really to make a voice memo for myself. 
and then it just continued and continued and continued and it actually turned out to be all right and I was like oh umming and ahhing like, oh god people are going to hear the waterfall I, you know I'm like doing heavy breathing no one's going to want to listen to this and I thought Do you know what just put it up who cares you know Bill Burr podcasts in his car and god knows where and his kids walking in and it, it's sort of like it's real life um, and people actually responded really well to that one. So that encouraged me to just be like, okay, people want content. They're not so worried about not hearing a hiss or not hearing breathing or whatever, or well, certain people aren't anyway. And being outside and moving around was just much better. It's sort of like the difference between working in an office and not, or not, you know, it brought back that feeling of like, okay, I'm going to sit at my desk and here's my computer and these are the things, here's my to-do list of things that I want to talk about. Um, instead of just going out and just being like, right, I'm going to talk about this. And that's much more of a creative flow process than doing it in a structured way. And I think because I was a hypnotherapist for such a long time, you know, when you're learning hypnotherapy, you, you read scripts because you're so scared of, of not having a script and it doesn't really matter because the person's got their eyes closed and what have you. And then after a while you get comfortable with it, you get comfortable with just free flowing speech and the fact that there are pauses and that kind of thing. So I just went back to that format basically. And if, if there are pauses or I forget what I'm saying, I can just edit it. It's not a big deal. So that's what works for me. Yeah, I like the, the free-flowing thing better also. Like most of my guests are, like I, I ask them if there's something particular they want to talk about, and they're like, no, ask away. You, you know, you can yeah. go to my website or whatever, you can look through it, but just like, um, but some of them do want the questions beforehand. Um, maybe, right, okay. maybe if, um, but that's a very few of them. Yeah. I'm speaking, this is, you're my 60th, episode wow congratulations yeah. that's a yeah. lot of uh people to organize <laughs> yeah yeah the scheduling is a little tricky but it it all falls into place it all yeah you just um but people do also like a lot of the compliments that i get from the listeners are the organic nature of it yeah so maybe i'll have like somebody like like your, your cat walks across the, the screen <laughs> and uh like uh yeah. Uh, David Weck was on, so he's you know, like a pretty famous guy. He invented the Bosu ball and you know a lot of other great things. He's a genius. His dog is barking. His wife walks by carrying laundry, and <laughs> yeah, this, this, exactly. is, this is this real thing. It's not like this. Yeah. If I um, were to like, which I was like, of course I was looking you up because I, I, you know, I'm not going to have you on and just like try to talk about jujitsu or something like that. Yeah. But, that you don't care about of course we have our, our subjects but i don't just write out like okay here's 10 to 15 questions and i'll ask one then you'll answer it and then i'll ask this next one mm -hmm. i'm what i'm doing is i'm trying like here's our subject and then just like a regular conversation yeah what you say is going to give me my next question and maybe like it'll Maybe I don't have a, a question, but, uh, but oh, that reminds me of this. And yeah. then that inspires another little, like, little uh, anecdote or, or story for you to tell. And people say that they like that better than just like this list of questions because I'm, I'm actually like listening to you yeah. to get my next idea instead of planning my next question when you're speaking. Yeah. But going back to the, uh, the hypnotherapy, um, this... Uh, well, as an ex-girlfriend of mine, she said she went to, uh, she got hypnotized one time and it was like all of a sudden, like her, uh, her uh, internal monologue shut off. Like mm. there was no, like all of a sudden it was just um, like her, that inner, basically that's it. Like her inner monologue shut off. It's like when you were doing your, your hypnotherapy like did you have specific things that you were trying to help people with or was it like how does that whole thing how does yeah that i think yeah i think some people have a bit of fear around hypnosis in general because there's there's always the fear of what if i lose control what if all of my darkest secrets come out what if someone gets me to do something that i don't want to do and so at the time when i was studying it the main things that people were looking for were weight loss or 
to quit smoking. Those were the two big ones. But I, it didn't really interest me. So what ended up happening was mainly people coming for sort of emotional issues, a lot of people with depression and anxiety, and body issues, addictions, that kind of thing. And it, it's, it's a very similar state of consciousness to meditation, which is what I worked out. So I'm not surprised that her inner monologue shut off because what you're doing is, is, is attempting to get the conscious mind out the way. So what, what we call it in hypnosis is the gatekeeper, right? You know, someone comes to you and they want to lose weight or get fit. Part of the problem is their inner monologue, which is going, oh, you're never going to do that. Or go on, just have a bit of pizza. So you've constantly got this gatekeeper that's stopping you from doing stuff. So once you shut that off through the hypnosis process, which is basically a deep state of meditation, you can then get into the subconscious mind and start giving people positive suggestions, which are completely and immediately adopted because there's not that other part of the brain going, that's never going to happen. Or, you know, you're not good enough to do that. So that's why it works quite quickly for people if they can get into a deep, a deep state. And that's why when people really get into meditation, you know, no matter how you do it, we've all got our different ways. You, your mind is just like, just a little bit quieter, you know? And I think a lot of people struggle with meditation because again, they're trying to do it a certain way or there's a checklist of stuff. But the, the best way that I've found is just to get out into nature and just start walking around in a peaceful place and your mind will naturally quieten. But if you're trying to meditate for like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, you know, I, I explain it this way. If you wanted to be a ballerina, you know, you wouldn't sort of practice in your work shoes in your living room. And, 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 and get any kind of result. You would get the proper equipment, you would find a teacher, you would go to a, a specific dance studio. And it's the same way with any sort of spiritual practice, you've got to dedicate some time to it. And if what you're doing isn't working, just try something else, you know, try your own way of doing it. And often when you're not trying, that's when it just kicks in. But, but um, having guided meditations or guided, um, hypnosis CDs will help you just to get into that frame of mind or go and see a hypnotherapist because someone else is doing that for you and you'll have the experience that your ex-girlfriend had of like, oh wow, I actually don't have any thoughts. And so many people just never have that experience. So if you can get some help doing it initially, then do it. Yeah, it's, I, I haven't been... Uh, to a hypnotherapist before I think I've, I've gone I've gotten like the CDs to um, listen to and like some like the um, it's called like brain tap or something like that yeah. where like you have the um, headphones and it's like two different things going mm -hmm. on and you're um, well to get back to the, the meditation and, and the one that they talked about I was going to write that book down so it was like cutting the ties that bind or what was it yeah that's exactly it. Cutting the Ties That Bind by Phyllis Crystal. She's a psychologist that came up with her own way of working with people that would sort of facilitate change much more quickly. And she gives a really simple meditation that you do five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. And what you're visualizing is a symbol. It's an infinity symbol. And cutting the ties is all about letting go, letting go of things from the past. So you're doing this really simple visualization, but the, the changes that start to happen are so sort of intense that well, that's what kept me pursuing it because of the changes that were happening rather than going to like a really long meditation class or some sort of like 10 day retreat. Just start off small, you know, you're more likely to keep it up if you're just, if you're starting off on a regular basis with short periods, but just make sure that you're sort of creating a nice space for yourself. I don't think you have to be sitting up rigid and doing any sort of poses, but like light a candle, make sure you're not going to be disturbed for like 20 minutes, half an hour and just breathe really. And if you want to put some sort of nice music on, then all the better. It's really just about distracting yourself from, from uh, your mind, you know, all the worries that we all think about all the time, you know, 
and just getting to that state of calm. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check <clears throat> check that book out and like mostly like the, the meditation I do is like like Zen meditation and um, you just like focus on your posture, sit in like seiza, and then just uh, which is like sitting on your ankles if people don't know what that is, and then your hands in like cosmic mudra like like this in front of your like on your lap and and then you just concentrate the posture because like correct posture allows correct breathing. So you're not like breathing in four x exhale four, you know that kind of stuff. Not that I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But just to get to that, because um, if you're trying to like inhale four and exhale four, it's and and that's too much. You get to like eights and twelves, and it's going to cause like a panic or something like that. And you're not going to be able to if you just like concentrate the posture or like in your what you're saying is like a, a different sort of thing, but it seems like it has the same or a similar uh, benefit because you're like clearing the mind a, a different way, right? Yeah, and like people respond differently to different things. Some people are, are really heavily focused on, on visual stuff. So it's quite easy for them to visualize things and some people can't. So it's much better for them to have some sort of, you know, om or music that they can focus on or some people want to look at the flame of a candle. So it's really, I suppose, about trying different things out and then just doing what works for you. So much of what goes on today is we're constantly looking for other people to tell us what to do. Well, if you think about it, if you're into spirituality, you understand what meditation is. So reading 50 books about meditation, it's like, well, all you need to do is read one, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's such a, it's a simple practice. It's not learning how to play the piano or, or being a jujitsu master, but you do still have to practice it and just give yourself a break and not beat yourself up so much when it, when it's like, I can't meditate. It's like, yeah, well just relax. You know, Joe Rogan talks about going in the flotation tank. Mm -hmm. So your, your senses are completely deprived and it's just like you're floating, you feel weightless. Well, that would be a perfect thing to try. You might freak <laughs> out, but at least you've <laughs> tried, you know? Yeah. Have you, have you done the floating? No, I'm too scared. <laughs> yeah. We did. Uh, I did one time. I, I, I thought it was pretty cool, but uh, I, I'm not a, a water guy. I don't, I'm not a good yeah. swimmer. And um, so I kind of wondered how it would be. Mm. But, I mean, not that I'd be like scared in like a foot of water, but just like since I'm not a water person. Uh, but I was surprised at how you float. Like, yeah. like you're not. And but the thing with uh, where I was, like, I kept like, I was like, breathing calm and everything, but still like, um, I would kind of like hit into the side, like, so I'd like hit my head and I'd like getting into a nice relaxed space and then I'd like, my head would bounce into the side of it. And so that was yeah. kind of um, distracting. Did you feel like claustrophobic or anything? Not really. Um, yeah. And they had the option where you could like play music if you wanted or have lights oh kind of like light show kind of thing going on there but i chose just just uh just darkness and floating and and i, I liked it but I, I just wish it was bigger or somehow mm. um not hitting my head every couple minutes yeah I'm trying to expecting. yeah so maybe there's um a way to prevent that by mm -hmm. somehow but um, you mentioned uh, like the so like when, when you like when you're going out to these places. So I think like getting into like, like streams of like consciousness is what I was kind of like thinking of, and and like this show like I mentioned I don't usually have a list of questions. It's more like just a few topics, and then see what happens, and that's what people seem to like to listen to. And uh, do you I, do you have is it so when you're going out to the the woods or something like that do you find that it just helps you like tap into this stream of consciousness? I find it interesting when people like some guests you like ask them a question and their answer is like two sentences, and then it's time for me to ask another question. Yeah. And it, <laughs> that causes like this 
it, it can be it's more difficult and some guests you just hit record and they're and they're off and they'll they'll speak for which i think is perfectly fine they'll speak for five ten minutes sometimes more I, i've had people that just like kept going and going and i've like written before that i think sometimes i'm doing my best job as a podcast host when i'm just sitting back and i'm drinking my coffee and and the ho and the guest is just on this like stream of consciousness explaining whatever it is that they're explaining so you when you go out to the woods you define like you can just hit this stream of consciousness easier and yeah. less of a yeah it depends like I, I have to really be in the mood like i didn't do a podcast this week so maybe since the beginning of this year since i started i've done one a week apart from maybe three times and this week was one of those weeks and you know, again, it's one of those things of like, oh, what if I don't do it every week, then people will think I'm flaky or whatever it is. But I've just come to realize that if it's not there, then it's just not ready yet. It's sort of like any kind of um, creativity. When people talk about having like writer's block or something like that, and then they start panicking about having writer's block because they want to do it now. You know, it's, it's sort of, counteractive to that creativity because then you end up with with something that's not that good but you've just forced it because you want it to be now so I, i've sort of done that a couple of times with the podcast and listen back and just been like this is just boring <laughs> you know what i mean mm. so um yeah sometimes i just need to take a break because maybe you know i'll write down things throughout the week that i think uh, either interest me or i think you know experiences that i've had but I like to have like an overall sort of theme and it's sort of a feeling that I get that it's just like, Oh, okay. I think, I think I've got something to say and I'll just start walking and I'll just, and I'll start talking. And most of the time it, it flows. And actually most of the time this used to happen to me when I was writing as well. I don't really remember what I've been talking about. You know what I mean? It's that sort of, not an out of body experience, but when I listen back, I'm like, oh, actually I'm making some pretty good points. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, Cause, cause my um, opinions about something um, might cloud actually some much more interesting, higher type consciousness that will come through when I've got over whatever opinions I've been, you know, mulling over about whatever topic. And being, being out somewhere where there's just space everywhere, there's just space and mountains and trees and water, there's no interference. Um, yeah, it seems to be the way to go. Yeah, but no, no interference. That, yeah. That's, uh, that's an interesting way of, uh, of putting it and just being able to tap into that. So are you still doing these? um the morning and evening meditations from this from no. that book you just you find it just like going out to the woods is it takes you to that yeah i i think when we lived in the cabin it was really rustic and we didn't have tv or wi-fi or any of that stuff we barely had sort of phone reception and we've moved to this new place just down the road in in the village and so we have access to wi-fi and what i what i noticed was having been without it all that kind of interference for like three and a half years it really started to affect me and so I, I, I started once again to properly meditate and take like half an hour at the end of the day or whatever to just center myself again because you know what it's like when you get on social media or, or whatever is going on in the news and everyone's like ah, frantic I really had to just be like okay I need to, to have some space I need to create some space um, so yeah, I don't think, again, it's, I, I meditated for years and then I stopped meditating when I came up here because I felt that I didn't really need to, because I was in that sort of headspace all the time. I detached from the nine to five. I didn't have any pressure really on myself apart from stuff that I made up in my head. Um, and I didn't have Wi-Fi signals, TV signals, traffic, other people. I did, didn't have any of that stuff. So my sort of natural state of consciousness when I was in nature was the same as the state of consciousness of nature, which is just like cool, breathe, ha you know, happy, accepting, loving, peaceful and quiet. And it's like, oh great, I can just 
be of that sort of same frequency without even really trying. And it's funny when we have people who sort of still live in the city who come and visit us, all they're worried about is what's the Wi-Fi code? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, guys, just properly relax and see how you feel when you do that. And I suppose there are people who don't like silence because they don't like what silence brings up. You know, if you're running away from a lot of stuff and you're unhappy and you're confronted with silence or no distractions from your phone or whatever, is you're going to feel uncomfortable. And I think that's actually why a lot of people find it difficult to meditate. It's not they can't meditate. They don't like what's coming into their mind when they're trying to silence their mind. And so mindfulness has become almost this way of like, well, let's just have no thoughts. And it's like, that's not what mindfulness is. What are the thoughts you're having and why is really the question that a lot of people don't want to answer. You know what I mean? Suddenly it's like, oh, maybe my relationship isn't that great. Or maybe I don't like my job. Or maybe all this stuff that happened to me when I was a kid is, is suddenly front and center in my mind. I don't want to think about that. Oh, let, let's distract myself. Let's do something different. So you don't get anywhere because part of the spiritual path is confronting all of those things that present themselves when you're in silence. And so we were talking before about, um, we were saying David Icke was saying about the spiritual path isn't like, you know, and, and suddenly everything's fine because you've gone down this spiritual path. It's actually the opposite. It's difficult because you've got to confront your own stuff. And who really wants to do that? Not many people, I would say. Yeah, it's definitely a careful what you ask for kind yeah. of a, kind of a thing. Because all of a sudden there's like all this work to do, and this. Um, um, I was listening to uh, a Pema Chodron. Do you know who she is? Yes. Okay, so I was listening to uh, one of her uh, books on CD. I have about a thirty minute drive to my job job. And mm -hmm. so I, I usually listen to something like that, but she was talking about how our, um, like the, like the definition of the ego for her is like having this fixed, um, like definition of yourself. So I'm, I'm this, I'm a good guy. I'm honest. I do this. I take care of my, my bills. I take care of my, and then if you say something to well, um, to uh, contradict what I just, this, I'm this, and I'm this, and I'm this, and I'm this. And you say, well, actually, you, uh, you point something out to me that contradicts one of those things that I'm trying to like, say that I am. Then I, now I'm upset with uh, you or right now where there's this conflict because you have pointed out that this is actually where I fell short and I, I, I wasn't maybe 100% honest here. Maybe I was kind of honest, but not fully honest, not as honest as I could have been because I was trying to make something happen. I was trying to get what I wanted. So I only put out 55% of the truth and, and left this part out to not um, get in the way of what I want. And then so that makes me mad and then that's that's like showing that the ego, so the ego is having this like fixed view of ourself. And uh, like you were mentioning in like one of your posts, like the, the shadow, I think you did a, a podcast about the shadow uh, or shadow selves and like what were um, like these things that come up in, in meditation, like, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. I should have been more honest here. I should have um, done something different in, in this spot and, and so much of the this spiritual thing is looking at the things we don't want to look at and like with the relationships that we have um like i was i guess my last relationship i guess you could say like maybe we wanted like some different things like it seemed like a lot of the stuff was pretty um worked out pretty well but maybe there was like some difference in like um, lifestyle stuff i guess you could say and uh, like she like say like you don't even say like what you need. And I was like, well, I don't really need anything. And she's like, that doesn't make sense. How can you not need anything? And I was like, do I need this arm? I really want this arm. I don't want to lose my arm. Mm. I, I don't. I I appreciate my arm. 
I don't want to lose it, but do I need it? There's people that get, get by with one arm. There's people with no arms. Do they need an arm? It would certainly be helpful, but they don't really need it. And there's people without legs and there's people without, there's people that have millions of dollars. Do they need millions of dollars? Well, yeah, if they want the million dollar house and they want the fancy car and they want, I want that too. I'd like to have millions of dollars. I'm not, I'm not trying to resist having a lot of money mm. or, uh, but do I, but what do I actually need? And so yeah. it was this thing where maybe my ideas of didn't quite go along with, with hers. And so did you find like with your, uh, uh, partner now like you're like this cabin with without the wi-fi and without the do you think was that like good for the relationship or bad or was it like are you are you both just like on the same place or is it something like oh we, we should get this fancier car or man this house yeah it's it costs a lot more but man look what it has is there yeah. Yeah, we're, we're sort of similar in the sense that we're both creative and, and I suppose um, we're not that materialistic. That doesn't mean we're always on the same page necessarily. Um, but I, I think the sort of need that you're talking about is like, it, I don't crave anything, if that makes sense. I don't have any sort of like burning need and if I don't have it, I'm gonna like, my life is over. You know, and I think a lot of people do have those kinds of um, cravings or expectations and, and to not have them is unusual. So in a way, I'm not surprised your ex-girlfriend was like, what do you mean you don't need anything? Because probably that would be a lot of people's response. You know what I mean? Um, as for living in the cabin, was it good? It was good in the sense that we really got to know each other because, you know, when we used to download documentaries or podcasts and stuff, but we couldn't just sort of flick on the TV or, you know, we actually had to have proper conversations. It's sort of like going traveling with your partner. You realize quite quickly when you're doing that, if you can survive in that intense environment. Um, so yeah, it was good in that sense. Um, I don't know if I would recommend it necessarily because <laughs> it was quite isolating in a lot of ways, but we both got to do what we wanted to do creatively. And, and we both gave ourselves that sort of break from, from, yeah, needing to have to do all this stuff that we didn't want to do, which is essentially what a lot of people do every day. They're doing stuff they don't really want to do. And the payoff is the big house and the big car, if they work hard enough or they're lucky enough. Mm. But if you don't want those things that much anyway, then the sort of nine to five grind, it's like, what is what is the point of this? Because I don't want to be a millionaire. You know what I mean? I just want to live a happy, simple life. And I think for people to accept that that's okay too, you know what I mean? It's perfectly acceptable to have a quiet and simple life. You don't have to be this like super mega achiever all the time if you don't want to. There's pleasure in chopping wood and carrying water. You know what I mean? and sort of hanging out with your animals and, and hanging out with your friends and yeah, just, just going for a nice walk. There's pleasure in that. And it's, it is way less stressful than being on the constant sort of, I've got to achieve this and I've got to have this. That's, that's, you know, in Buddhism, that's where suffering comes from, isn't it? Mm. Craving. Yeah. And people forget that teaching actually. Craving comes from suffering in Buddhism. People focus on Buddhism in terms of meditation and mindfulness. But the, the central teachings are life is suffering and mm -hmm. <laughs> suffering is caused by craving. So, you know, yeah, want things and have goals, but be a bit flexible, I suppose, is, is some good advice. Because you don't have control, do you? None of us really have 100% control of our lives. So when things don't work out in the way that you want, like your relationship ends or you, you suddenly find out you can't have kids or you lose all your money, these are the times when you can rely on some sort of spiritual practice or at least you know yourself well enough that you can cope. You're competent when these things happen. It's not trying to avoid these um, sort of negative experiences in life. It's just like, yeah, shit happens and I can deal with it no matter what. 
And that's, that, again, that brings freedom because you're not constantly like being anxious about what's around the corner. So there's a lot of benefit to doing these spiritual practices rather than just seeing them as a way to like transcend away to some heavenly realm where nothing's going to harm you. They give you strength in times of adversity, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And there is something about like the relationship that, um, that I had and it was like, it seemed like it was, um, I guess like from my perspective, it was like, it was, it was really good except like when she started bringing up problems and stuff. <laughs> and like, she's like this, she's like a really great person. And it seemed like we got along pretty, um, well and everything. And she did kind of like push me to, um, I guess, uh, like do, do some things better and like my, my thinking. And, um, so I, I have, um, uh, a lot of res respect for her like that. And, um, I, I helped her out in different ways. So I, um, push her in, the, um, the right way. It's not like I was like trying to like push her into like do, being a certain way, but she uh, appreciated how, her thinking has changed uh, since we were together. And so there is something about having someone that's, that, that can like be encouraging and push you to the next step, you're, but without saying like, you're not good enough right now, you need to be like this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where a lot of the, the problems come from is, so if we're, if we're together, it's like, you're perfectly fine just the way you are. Um, you're not as fully developed or something like that as, as you, you could be. So it's like, you're, you're fine just the way you are. And I'm encouraging you to get better in the ways that you want to get better, but not in, in such a way that's going to cause like a, a conflict and, and be able yeah. to have like some kind of a space to allow these, things to happen. Like I was listening to a uh, Eckhart Tolle um, uh, book on audio book and his partner, uh, Kim Ang, I don't know if they're married or just together. Um, but like at the, at the end of the book, she like did like the last chapter or something like that. And she was kind of, she was talking about how like he moves really slow. So when they, when they take the, they have like six containers that they take to recycling and she has emptied three of them and he, he just got done emptying one. And it's, so it's like frustrating because she's like trying to get this done. So she already did her half. Should she just go sit in the truck and wait till he finishes the other two or just yeah. get it done. And uh, he doesn't help with the cooking unless she asked. And like, the, so she was kind of like venting a little bit, but also she said that, they have their own house that they bought together and they each have their own apartment. Perfect. So I guess they, <laughs> so I think uh, something that I've been thinking about and something that I was talking to like a couple like friends about and like the woman I was seeing and uh, it seems like nowadays it seems like, uh, like I was on like this dating uh, uh, app not, not too long ago and you're like flipping through it and a lot of it is like these women are asking for um they're like polyamorous they they have like their which i'm not into that at all i don't really judge what other people are into but that i'm not i wouldn't be into that at all and like well we're in this i'm married but we're in an open relationship and and th this kind of stuff and just the the percentage of people wanting that, and it wasn't a, a dating site for this kind of lifestyle. It was uh, just, um, it was called Bumble. It's like one where like, if you match up, the woman has to send the first message. Right. Okay. So it's, um, but anyways, I was like, man, why is this like that? Cause that, is that really healthy to, um, yeah. it doesn't seem like it to me, but maybe it works for some people. And, and I don't even really know how well it works for, um, anyone and there's but it seems like this paradigm of like all right so more than half of marriages end in divorce okay and then what happened before then so like the the boy that you 
you had a crush on in third grade, you probably thought that's this is gonna be this is forever. Yeah. He's so cute. He's like so like the you know the my old girlfriend in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, like why didn't those relationships work out? Mm -hmm. It seemed so perfect at the time, fourth grade and um and then well what about the girls in junior high? Why didn't that work out? What about the ones in high school? So it's not like once you, I've never been married. Um, I have two kids, two, like different moms, and but, anyways, uh, like so. By the time somebody gets married, they've already had maybe like ten relationships not work out, or twenty. You mm -hmm. know, like, so like going back to like the one, the the, the crush in in your kindergarten or whatever. And it, you know, it's kind of silly to think, well, that that didn't work out. But why not? If they're like yeah. so great. This, kinder, this kindergarten thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But so, like, by the time we get to the the marriage, we've already had twenty relationships that didn't yeah. work out. And so, is it a big surprise that the twenty first one didn't work out? So I'm thinking, well, what? Maybe there's this new paradigm, and not everybody's has to be the same. Certainly, there's lifestyle differences that people are into different things, and if you can find somebody that's, um, weird in the same way you are, then, <laughs> then great. But do you uh, have like thoughts on that? Like like this uh, somewhat kind of new paradigm of like relationships or like yeah relationships? yeah I think um, people get into relationships for the wrong reasons, and a lot of those reasons end up being um, things like they don't want to be alone. Yeah. Or there's some sort of financial payoff, you know. Mm. Or they want to have kids. You know, there's a there's a social pressure to get married. I mean, especially for women, a lot of women have that sort of fairy tale view in their mind, and they also have the fairy tale view that they're going to be taken care of by a man financially, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of these sites actually, you know, they're vetting men based on their jobs, right? You guys are sort of generally ranked in terms mm -hmm. of how much you earn and all that kind of thing in this sort of paradigm. Yeah. And so. You, they, it's sort of like this, this really romantic idea, I think, that people still have of happily ever after. But then choosing relationships for the wrong reasons or reasons they don't really understand themselves. They're projecting this image onto the person who they've chosen. And then what a surprise, that person doesn't live up to their expectations because it wasn't that person anyway. It's that love is blind thing in the beginning. So... I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think the answer is um, having lots and lots and lots of different partners forever. Mm. And uh, I think that sort of seems like a nice thing to have, but it's, it's a bit unstable, you know what I mean? And it also means you're not really committing to anything. And I think, I think people like that idea more and more these days. You know, you want to, you get bored of stuff quite quickly. And so you want to swipe right or whatever and, and mm -hmm. find someone new and this person's going to be the person of my dreams and then once you've done that a while i think people just get tired so then they just latch on to the next person and get married to that person but they haven't really thought about why they're doing it maybe that's the key people aren't thinking about why they are getting into a relationship you used the phrase a minute ago something like um i want to encourage you to do what you want to do that would be like an ideal thing instead of trying to get someone else to be who you want them to be, it would be ideal to be with someone who's like, I think you're great. And obviously, hopefully we're going to grow together, but I generally want what you want for you. And if that means at some stage we part or we're no longer, you know, on the same page, then we can just separate and everything is sort of, you know, amicable, but we're so, attached to people so much codependency dressed up as love well if you've got a desperate fear of being on your own like anyone will do you know and i was definitely like that when i was younger and stayed in some terrible relationships because i couldn't bear to be the thought it wasn't even i couldn't bear being on my own the thought of being on my own because i felt so empty inside so, and that was part of the reason that I moved to Australia. I left everything and the person that I went there with, we broke up after about a year and I had about six years of being single. Hmm. It, and it was almost like a boot camp 
of like, right, you're going to be single. You're not just going to choose whoever comes along because that's just a, an energy drain. Just be by yourself. And it worked wonders because now I know I'm not in a relationship with anyone just because I need, I need it. It's because that's the ideal, isn't it? You, you find someone who you like and who you respect and who you trust. You've got similar values and you, you're together. But not so together that you're never going to break up. Mm -hmm. It's just we're together and as long as it's good and yeah, let's, let's all have our own apartment so we don't have to put up with like, do you know what I mean? Someone that doesn't do the washing up or whatever. It's, you can be very different people and have your own space. And as long as you're, you like being with each other, so many couples, you see them, you're like, you guys don't even like each other. Yeah. You know, they're just bickering and it's just one drama after the other. And it's like, why bother? Because you're addicted to the drama. So a bit of thought, I think, a little bit of awareness of who you are and actually what you need in a relationship. Do you really need someone who's a millionaire and who's going to sweep you off your feet and buy you a car and you're never going to have to work again? But actually he's going to treat you with no respect. Is that what you want? Or do you want someone who, you know, doesn't care about money, but it's going to treat you like a queen or a king or whatever. So you have to work out what your own values are before I think you can choose a correct partner. And I think a lot of people with marriage, as with kids, is they do it because everyone else is doing it. You know, all of my friends, as soon as the first one got married, everyone got married within the space of like two or three years. <laughs> you know? No thoughts. And are they happy now? No. Yeah. Do you think there's like, we have uh, the one, do you think like that we're, or do you think, um, cause like with, uh, to get like kind of personal, I guess, but it's like after um, like this last relationship ended, like there was this other woman who I kind of knew from before and like, just like this weird sequence of uh, events. Like we kind of like started seeing each other like al almost right away. I mean, it was kind of like this weird thing. And I had spent, um, not too long ago, I was single for like 10 years. Wow. And I just kind of like lived like a, a monk and was just like, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to really go out with anybody. I'm, if the right person comes along, okay. But if not, then, and like my buddies were, like you know trying to like rack up the numbers of women and and they didn't understand what i was doing they're like yeah. what are you doing like this girl's good to go she likes you what what do you like eh, no thanks and um but i had like this thing happen where because I, I haven't like tried to date, date a lot of girls but this thing happened where um one of them she like broke up with me and it was like the, the day before my birthday, like five minutes before my birthday, like 11 55 PM. Before. And okay. All right, fine. And then, um, um, I'm going to try not to give away like too much. If people like know me really well, they, they probably, they, they know, but, um, I don't want to make anybody look bad or good that could be figured out by, whoever but anyway so this other uh girl pops up and we kind of had a, a thing for each other before but i was at the time i was with a friend of hers a good friend of hers so we we met and like there was like this spark but neither one of us ever said anything to anyone didn't mention it didn't say anything to each other and then we um, popped into each other's life again some years later and so we kind of started hanging out and then the girlfriend that had broke up with me right before my birthday which she was like this is just like a, a rebound thing I thought you and I were going to get back together we were just like um, and she's like basically any girl that will pay attention to you will do I'm like well actually no I mean it wasn't long ago I was by myself for 10 years I, it's not like that but then I started to wonder or like think like okay well there is something to be said for if someone has just given me a completely hard time or like everything's fine, like we're hanging out, everything's fine. And then the next day there's some kind of problem 
Mm. Like, okay, nothing happened. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. It's just like the stuff that was going on in your mind happened. And then so next time we see each other, there's some kind of issue. Now you're upset. Nothing. There was no event. But now, you're, so there is something to be said for like, okay, if this person's not going to be giving me a problem, if we can just have fun and go to a concert and do uh, whatever. And so I was like wondering, well, maybe there's not the one, but it's just like the, the um, maybe there's like different ones or maybe that is the one that's not going to be giving you a hard time unnecessarily like but you believe that like there is a the one or you um i don't maybe it's different for different people um i think I've, maybe i've got one couple of friends who i believe were always sort of destined to be together and their met their wedding was amazing and everyone was crying and you know, they're that couple right that's mm. pretty rare um, I think that there are definitely people in your life who you come together with to learn certain lessons, let's put it that way. So the, the sort of, I don't like to call them bad relationships. The relationships that were like hard work were, I'm still friends with those people because I recognize or we both recognize that we learned so much going through those sort of traumatic experiences. Um, do I think there's one, I think there's people that you connect with definitely and that there's a spark and that you're on the same page and there isn't the drama, you know, you can have those sort of drama -y relationships or it's just, it's easy. You know what I mean? And that could be one person or that could be multiple people. I think it's probably better to think of it that way. Because if you're constantly like searching for the one for the rest of your life, you're, you're probably going to be let down in some way. Because then again, they're not living up to your expectation of the one. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who are searching for their soulmate and their soulmate looks a certain way and, and is supposed to be a certain way. Um, but their soulmates already arrived. They just haven't looked because they're not a brunette or a blonde or a this or a that. So I think we can be too hung up on the ideal rather than actually using our eyes and our brains and looking around to see who's, who's suitable. Like, who do you have fun with? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. who, who, who are you on the same page with? And it's, of course, it's, it's, it's fine to sort of be totally different personalities. My partner and I are like completely different personality wise, but we've got very similar sense of humor, very similar values and we're relatively good at communicating with each other. You know what I mean? And even if we do have an argument, we can sort of see the funny side. Um, it's, it's when you lose that sense of humor that I think things go a bit, go a bit wrong. So yeah, I don't think there's a the one. I think there's lots of ones. Yeah, that makes sense. Like the, the one in third grade that didn't work out only lasted for two weeks, but man, all the hey she might come back into your life right and it'll be like oh my god because sometimes it's timing mm -hmm. you know what i mean you met you met this girl or there's another girl or another guy that, that i've met in the past and there's like a, a sort of intense connection and you're like oh my god and then it's like sliding doors it's not going to happen mm -hmm. and then you meet up with them like 10 20 years later that happens all the time so sometimes it's just not the right time uh, how did you meet your, uh, are you married um, or your, your current partner? How did, how yeah, did it's a bit of a weird, it's one of these sort of weird um, coincidental things like um, after I'd left Australia and I was in London and I was doing all this writing, I would uh, post it up on Facebook just for people to read, you know. And um, he was a friend of a friend of mine through the sort of Facebook network and he um, was reading this stuff and he, he sent me an email out of the blue just saying oh, I've been reading your your articles and blogs and stuff they've really helped me and and um, the first time he contacted me I just sort of blew it off with was oh thanks you know didn't really want to engage with a stranger kind of thing um, and then anyway about a month later he he messaged me again and he sent me a link to some music he'd created and I listened to it and I was like wow this is amazing so it got the sort of talking and and I was at a bit of a loose end and uh, just a couple of weeks later, I ended up going to visit him in Edinburgh 
and we ended up coming up to the cabin for the first time. So that's, that's how I knew in a way that um, when I was unhappy in Edinburgh later, that the cabin was the place to go because it was such a magical place and we'd already spent a bit of time up there. So um, yeah, totally out of the blue, fate. And, and we've, we've learned some important lessons from each other. And certainly, I think a lot of people think relationships are just going to be like smooth sailing and hunky dory. But at the end of the day, relationships are how we learn. You know what I mean? So, yeah, have some have some discussions, have some arguments. You're going to bring up each other's issues, if you like. Whatever your your sort of core wound is, is going to be front and center. Um, and, and that's how you learn. And so if you're, if you're one of these people that's constantly like dismissing relationships after a few weeks because you're not, you've lost interest, you're losing the learning opportunity. I'm not saying stay with everyone for like forever, just so you're learning stuff, but it's like, this is where you learn your lessons through interactions with other people, whether it's relationships or friendships or family or whatever. So don't run away from it, even though it's confronting, like, go into it and see what, what's coming up for you and for them, you know, why are you triggering each other? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's um, because these people are going to be um, pushing that part, like the Pema children's definition of the ego is like having a, a, a fixed view of yourself and, and you want to think of this, this and this, and I'm honest. And then you're pointing out, yeah, you, you weren't lying, but you weren't, you left this part out. And so I want to like fight that because no, I didn't. And I don't have a real specific instance in mind, but, um, you, but this person's going like, so will you look at that? And so instead of arguing with them, like think, um, maybe I, I, I could still do better. Like, am I really good? Okay. But I could still do better. And having that person that's going to like push you in a, in a positive way and be kind of have. That's the key, I think, to have it in a positive way, because often we get into just total criticism of each other, you know, as opposed to actually sitting down and trying to be constructive about it. It just becomes a, a massive uh, blame operation. You know what I mean? Which mm -hmm. really gets people nowhere. So if you can get past the like mudslinging of who did what and who's a bad person and all of that, and, and, you know, have the first argument and then have the analysis of the argument, you know, where you can kind of go, okay, yeah, uh, maybe I, I wasn't correct in that way. And I'm sorry about that. You know, you have a bit of humility about it, but it's sort of like in the same way that you look out on social media these days or anywhere where you've just got two sides, just like screaming at each other and nothing is resolved because, because, because each side wants to be right. I don't want you to tell me that I'm not honest or I'm selfish or I'm whatever. I'm going to, if I feel I'm being attacked, I'm going to attack you, mm -hmm. but it gets, gets us nowhere. Yeah. The social media, you asked me before we started recording, if I was paying attention to the, um, is it Kavanaugh or whatever his, his name is. And Kavanaugh, yeah, Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, and I I used to listen to talk radio, like political talk radio, all day. Mm -hmm. And so I knew every day I could give you like 20 different things that you should be really mad about. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I just decided I'm not going to do that anymore. So I, I quit paying attention to it because it was like, okay, there's like everything is just um, – Democrat bad, Republican good, or the opposite, or mm -hmm. like you're either a Democrat or you're a Republican, or you get, yep, and then you're supposed to be arguing about these things and these talk shows. They would be making like the same points, and they would like have the the opposing argument, and then the counter to that, and like everything. It just seemed to be all orchestrated in such a way to just keep people mad and and arguing. And I guess I had a. Um, a point of like I don't consider myself like fully enlightened or anything like that but I think I've had different like realizations and uh, and like one of them was about like duality and, and non-duality and it just kind of like um, yeah I've been I read about it for 20 some years or whatever but it just kind of like don't know you have to have 
it, like once um, once you start speaking or, or as soon as there's movement, you're going to have opposites mm. or um, so I'm, I'm a, a vegan. And so I have like all those vegan views and I can, I can defend them and, and I, they all make sense. I also teach at a wilderness survival school. So there's skins, there's animal skins, there's skulls and there's, um, so my friends are, are hunters mm -hmm. and they're not vegans. I mean, I have vegan friends, but a lot of my people that I, I respect are not anywhere close to a vegan. They, they kill animals, they eat the animals. And uh, there's like, not everything is, and, and so that has to be like that. How can you have a, a vegan if you don't have a hunter? Yeah, like, exactly. And so like, as, as soon as everything's set to motion, so like the, the understanding like duality and non-duality, so we can have like non-duality in that moment of like, we're all the same. Like every, every, everyone is, is the same thing. We're just like different. Um, my left and right hand, that they're different. They're like, they, they look a lot alike, but they're the opposite. But they're not really the opposite. They're, you know, so you can like continue on this path as soon as that. But like where my, I teach my, the owner of uh, the Wilderness Academy, his name is Matt Shaw and his grandfather was a Shikari. And in India, this is in the I think, 50s. Um, he, him and his wife, my buddy's grandma, lived in India for 20 years. And his grandfather's job was as a shikari. And uh, his, which is uh, a tracker. And so his job was to, it was a government job, and it was to hunt down the man eating cats because there could be a pretty small village a small area of maybe i don't know a few thousand people or something like that and there might be um three to five people killed per week by man-eating cats and the people at that time they didn't know how to use firearms or the weapons the, the indians and uh so his grandfather was there they were there as missionaries but then he he was this high level tracker so it's his job to find the mating eating cats and kill them and so one of the so is it wrong to kill the animal i would say yes it's wrong to kill animals oh it was killing people you're preventing it from killing another person how can i say that that's wrong so is it wrong or not well it, 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 you just can't yeah. have that that's the duality that has to exist which means there's like non-duality and so I, he might you imagine the the pressure okay so this uh leopard kills a kid it's not because the leopard is bad the leopard is old it can't catch wild animals anymore or it's injured it, it so it was just doing what leopards do it's not bad we can say it's bad to kill the kid and so his grandfather might use, sometimes the leopard might kill a person, leave that person there and come back for it later. Well, so his grandfather might climb up a tree by a dead person and wait for that leopard to come back. And you imagine the awareness that it would take and the, the pressure of, you gotta kill that animal before it kills you. And not only that animal, but nature is trying to kill you from every direction. There, the snakes, there's cobras, and there's other tigers, and there's all these things that are trying to kill you all the time. And you have to kill something to save something else's life, and, but they have like respect for the leopard. So like one man-eating cat might kill a hundred people. And so there's some of these, there's a couple of skins at the place I work of these man-eating leopards wow. and so i don't look at, at my buddy that hunts and, and kills as a bad guy i have a lot of respect for him i can learn a lot from him and i can't say that i know more about animals than him or i know a bit more about nature because you could put him out in the jungle somewhere with no clothes 
it would help if you gave him a knife, but he doesn't need, we talked about needs earlier, he doesn't need the knife, he'll make a knife out of something. Mm. So you can put him with no clothes, no tools, out in the middle of pr pretty much anywhere on the earth, and he can figure it out, I'd probably be dead. I'd like to think I could figure it out, but the reality is I'd probably be dead. And uh, I forget what uh, made me uh, go on that little little rant, but maybe just talking. I think it's this like over, you know, people like talking about duality and opposites, and, and it really comes down to, especially at the moment with people, what's right and what's wrong, or who's right and who's wrong. Mm. So everything is simplified in that way. And then if you're a certain kind of person, like if you're a vegan, then these are all the things that you believe. And if you're a woman, these are all the things you believe. You know, you're some kind of different race, religion, whatever. You've got your checklist because that makes things easy for you. And that's what I think people want. The, the life is crazy. It's getting crazier. Quick, give me the playbook, right? Give me the, the, the checklist so I know what's right and wrong. But every single, um, every single thing that goes on in the news, every single belief that we have is complex, like you've just demonstrated. And, and you know, you're a vegan and you can get your head around why it might be necessary in some situations to kill an animal, even though you don't want that to happen. And it's like people have lost that ability to have a bit of nuance in their thoughts. I mean, especially in the political arena, that's not a surprise. But what has surprised me recently is, is some sort of so-called spiritual teachers jumping on these political bandwagons. And they're supposed to be, I would suggest, if you're a spiritual teacher, be teaching about unity, right? The, the unification of opposites. In other words, looking at both sides of the story. And so to see stuff on, on social media um, in relation to Kavanaugh, but it could be any um, you know, thing that's going on in the media, people are taking massively biased stands and talking about tearing things up and tearing things down and all this sort of stuff. It's just, people have lost their perspective, I think. And I think that has come from um, being scared that things are changing. You know, it's, it's loads of aspects of life are shaking. All the institutions that we thought were gonna look after us, government, banks, religions, everything is like shaking, you know what I mean? It's like, oh God, what am I gonna believe in now? And, and then they become fundamentalist in some way, they become zealots, they become structured in what they believe. And if anyone's gonna say something against what I believe, well, then I'm gonna attack you and I'm gonna attack you viciously. Mm. That doesn't, you know, in a, in a way it saddens me because I thought we were moving along in quite a good direction in terms of like a global awakening and people sort of coming out of this illusion that we, that we have but it's like people are swapping one illusion for another and they don't want to think for themselves and they want to get into their little camps, women, men, gay, straight, religious, not religious, whatever it is. And they're going to stay behind their defensive walls and just start shooting, you know? And it's just like, guys, <laughs> can we all just listen a little bit? Can we all just sort of accept that we don't have to agree with each other and have the same beliefs? But yeah, it seems to be reaching a fever pitch for a, for a reason. And I hope that after the peak, it just starts to level out a little bit. We, we seem to be getting to a peak at the moment. But as you do, as what I've done, I, I dip into social media every now and again because I, I had that same experience of you being totally into it all the time and then just realizing that it was making me unhappy, you know, because I, essentially I can't do anything about a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can turn off your phone. You can not pursue it. And, and then you, you do start to get a bit more peace, as we've been talking about. If, you, if your face is in your phone and you're constantly looking at what's going on, you're going to feel much worse than if you detach once in a while. Yeah. So over in, over there, are you, you're getting a lot of our news. So you, 
Um, yeah. I, I vaguely know about the, the Kavanaugh thing. I guess it was like he. I think it's, ta- it's been tagged on to the whole Me Too movement because mm-hmm. he's been accused of sexual misconduct in his high school years. Um, and so, but the problem is he's just been accused. There's no evidence, there's no corroboration. Um, and the, the timing of it, which was at the 11th hour before they were gonna vote, you know, the, 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 it's not a cut and dried case by any means. But because there's this, this Me Too movement, which has morphed into something quite horrible, actually, where you can just accuse people and women must be believed all the time, you know, um, he's, yeah, he's getting absolutely raked over the hot coals. Um, and and it's, it's just another thing to divide people. You could choose anything, couldn't you? You could choose Trump, mm-hmm. right? That's going to divide the room instantly. You can choose yeah. any aspect. And now it's like this camp and this camp. If you're a Re- Republican, you believe this sort of stuff. If you're a Democrat, you believe this sort of stuff. And the only, you know, the good thing about it, you're talking about Joe Rogan and other people like Dave Rubin, um, you know, coming together and having these, these discussions with people from all over the, the political map or the social map to swap ideas when they're doing like a three hour long podcast where people are actually generally having a conversation and trying to learn from each other. Oh, wow, you're a Republican and you're a Democrat. Yeah, what have you got to say about whatever, abortion, gay rights, you know? And it's not like, you should believe what I believe. It's like, why, why do you believe that? And let's, let's try and figure it out. So that's, that's a good thing, you know, that that's happening alongside the circus and the screaming that's, that's there all the time now. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point that like to be able to listen to somebody's um, point of view. So like when I talk to like um, Matt, the, um, the owner of uh, the wilderness school that I work at, um, we might have like some different views on stuff, but I can, I can listen to him and he can listen to me and we're not trying to convince each other to um, start saying what the other person says. We're not trying to like, it, it can be just like, oh, what, what um, you know, put it like simply like music. Okay, uh, I like Pink Floyd's my all time favorite band and I like these different bands. And oh, you, uh, you like these bands. Okay, well, just like that, like you, you have these certain ways of thinking and it took you how, your whole life to get to this moment where you're saying this particular thing right now. Five years ago, maybe it was something different. But like to just be able to like listen to somebody and accept it rather than trying to make them um, think what you think. Because yeah. I, yeah. I would hope that I'm not like at this plateau of my thinking i'm hoping i'm understanding more and more over time so like what made sense to me when i was 20 i have a lot of those same thoughts but i'm not the same so just to think to think that someone else should be just at the exact same place at the same time whether it's like politically or, or whatever because i think once you kind of like dig into it and then like the, like the little in, enlightenment that I had of understanding duality and non-duality, like as soon as you start talking, it's, it's not gonna be correct because this one thing I was talking about with this uh, woman that I was seeing, I was like, so we're having these like conversations and sometimes like, why is it getting to a point where it's, it, like, why can't we make sense of it? Like, why can't we just like, here's a fact, two plus two equals four, uh, three plus one equals four here. So here we, here we are. This is either. And my thinking was, well, you can't really say exactly what you think, or you can't say exactly how you feel because we're using these words and these words were made up and these definitions are um, even changing over time. So you re and um, so in, in uh, you're in Scotland. So we're both speaking English. I understand you. Um, very well, but do I understand you um, 
like maybe you said something and I understood it. We're speaking the same language, but maybe your friend knows why you said that. And so this whole other like story that I have no idea about. So your friend understands your English better than you, than I do. And maybe you use, you know, sometimes we use different <clears throat> words. Uh, you know, we have different, you know, different countries that are using different words or different parts of the country. So I can, like, how well do we really understand each other? So even if we're with a partner and we're both speaking English and we're both trying to be good and honest, how much of it is getting lost in the translation from what we um, yep. feel to what we say? And um, there's uh, like Jordan Peterson. Do you know who he yeah. is? Okay, so there was uh, he was I like him a lot. And there was at, at the Queens College. Like there were these students protesting. I don't even think this didn't even seem like they knew what, what they were protesting. No. They want to call them a Nazi and stuff. It just yeah. absurd. They're banging on the windows, broke a window, old stained glass, and they're just freaking out about it. they don't even know why. But there was a, a, a student that came up and he was from Iran. And I don't think it didn't seem like he had been here for a long for a very long time. So he's like looking at what's going on. And so he asked Jordan, like, what's the most important thing we can do? Like, how do we convince those people that are banging on the windows of what you're saying? And, and Jordan said, basically, the most important thing you can do is learn how to um, say what you're thinking and to be able to. Um, so like, and if you if you're thinking something like it took Jordan like 12 years to write a book because he wrote it down and then he's. Um, criticizing or critiquing every line by line, word by word. Is that really the best word? Is that really what I mean? And then he sends it, he sends it to his buddy who's going to do the same thing, who's going to um, not be difficult for the sake of being difficult, but to, like, are you sure this is really what you mean? And it took him 12 years to re write a book that would not take three or four hours to read. So you have, like, um, yeah, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan and I sort of discovered him at the same time that I started doing the podcast. The first podcast that I did is, um, well, one of the first ones is about the hero's journey. Mm. And as soon as I put it up, a friend of mine sent me um, one of his lectures because he wasn't really famous over here yet. He wasn't really famous over here until that Kathy Newman interview. So she sent me this and I was like, oh, wow, this, this guy's really interesting. And I, I started to look at a few more of his, his videos. And now, of course, he's sort of blown up. But, you know, he, he always comes across as being a very measured, like he's, you can tell he's thought about these things a lot. It doesn't surprise me that it took him 12 years to write a book. And, and like how amazing it would be if we could all adopt a little bit of that because even though it took him 12 years, you can bet your life there are still people out there who are misinterpreting what he's saying. Well, they're doing it all the time, right, to a ridiculous extent. And A, it's because they're not really listening. You know, they'll get a couple of clips on um, YouTube that people have made where he's talking about white privilege or whatever other sort of contentious issue and label him some sort of Nazi. In fact, I've had friends of mine saying to me, what, why are you into Jordan Peterson? Isn't he some kind of right wing, you know, nutter? And it's just like, hey, why would I be into a right wing nutter? Like, what are you thinking that I'm some sort of Nazi? Do you know what I mean? It's like, just go away and read it. And they all come back and say, oh, wow, I didn't realize this is what he was saying. Um, so, yeah, just not, under not listening to each other. And even if you do hear something incorrectly, being able to go back to someone and just go, did you mean this? Because to me, it sounds a bit off or I don't really get it. Like people aren't even prepared to do that. They're just prepared to blanket judge people on, on, a, on a sound bite and then run with it because it fits their own little world of what that person is. Normally, if it's a man, some sort of, you know, vicious member of the patriarchy that must be torn down and trodden on because it's now it's all girl power right 
It's just, yeah. it's so toxic. And I hate that word because it's so overused, but it is. It's, we lose our humanity and we are being so divided into these little groups more and more and more now that it's just, it's, it's getting to, as I said, fever pitch. But the more that we can have these conversations and not get angry and, and share information, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman in Scotland, you're a guy in Indiana, and we're talking about um, Jordan Peterson and all these different topics, you know what I mean? And it's just like, why can't other people do this? <laughs> no, mm. because this to me is, is interesting. This is more interesting than being on Twitter and scrolling through and going, yeah, you know, mm. and getting really angry. Where does that get us? It doesn't get us anywhere. So, but it's everyone's responsibility to, to do that and to not get totally sucked into the noise, the noise. Yeah, if people could just like see why, and like one thing that Jordan talks about, you know, like the, the Nazi thing gets it's thrown around a lot, but he's like, if you were in their shoes, if you were there at that time, yep. you might think you're this person that's so great and so good, but you might be, you would more than likely be right along with them. Yep. And you get to the point of, um, it, it's, it's kind of hard to put ourselves in that position. Like, oh, I wouldn't be an odds. I'm not going to put Jews into a, uh, into a camp or a gas chamber. That's crazy. But is it? Cause those yeah, even, yeah. It. yeah. People are confronted by that statement and they'll immediately go, I would never do anything like that because yeah, of course it's like a horrific thing to do. But, even as a philosophical exercise to go into it, you know, forget about all of your outrage about how you would never do such an evil thing. Just think about it and then, and then try and, you know, think about it now. You know, the problem that I have with this women's movement that's going on at the moment is they are using exactly the same tactics that they are trying to um, rebel against. You know, they're vicious, they're dismissive, they're completely blinkered in their views about men in general, you know? And it's, and it's like, take, take, take the mirror and put it in front of yourself, you know? If only people could actually watch a video or have some sort of playback of the sort of vicious stuff that they're, they're sort of putting out on social media, you know, after the dust has settled and go, oh my God, I can't actually believe that I thought that or I said that because in the heat of the moment, you're just caught up in whatever stories in your head, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, of course, it, 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 so much of it is context, isn't it? Who's to say how we would have acted in Nazi Germany? Are we all going to say that we would have stood up, you know, against Hitler and then none of that would have happened? Well, 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 well if you think that, then where in your life are you standing up against um, things that you disagree with? Most people aren't. Mm -hmm. And standing up isn't, you know, signing an online petition or writing an angry tweet. If, if you, where are you, and this is a very Jordan Peterson thing, where are you in your own specific personal life demonstrating that you believe what you actually believe? You know, if you think you would stand up against oppression, where are you doing that in your life? Are you having difficult conversations with your partner or your boss or anyone? Or are you just thinking in your head that you'd like to do that? Because if you can't muster up the courage and the responsibility personally to change your personal life that's here in front of you, then you know what I mean? You've really got no business shouting into the collective about how things need to change if you're not gonna change it yourself. And that's tough medicine. And that's why people either love him or hate him. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's It seems like there is uh, like more and more um, awareness. Maybe that's, I guess, as the story goes, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. But it does seem like, it seems to me, and maybe it's part of it is what I'm paying attention to. Because I, I quit, I, I have it, when I was looking on Facebook, there was like a lot of negativity and a lot of political um, stuff. But when I was on, on Instagram, it seemed a lot more positive. 
Yeah. Everybody is like, say, like spiritual quotes. And, and uh, of course, a lot of people that I follow are like, you know, spiritual and workout stuff, trainers. And, and so I'm, I'm scrolling down and that's what I'm seeing. And then, so that's what my, that's, that's the kind of life that I'm, that I'm taking in. It's like these people that are proud because they just, um, you know, did a 200 pound deadlift or something like that. And they're, yeah. and in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal, but to them, it was this huge deal. So great. That's awesome that, that they just did that. Um, yeah, there's plenty of people that can do a lot more, but yeah, you should be proud because it wasn't long ago. You couldn't do that. But Facebook it seemed to be a lot more um, negative for some reason. And, and so maybe like a lot of it is like what we're, what we choose to, to focus on and I think with these um, conversations like that we're having now like these we get plenty of time we're not just trying to like squeeze in a five minute you know like way that like the talk shows used to be where you get uh, five minutes or there, or like ones where there's like 12 people on and they're all trying to say something yeah. clever and and it's so part of like these and like cause when you're like probably like you like starting out learning how to do podcasts and reading the tutorials and like a lot of it said like you know they should be between 20 and 40 minutes and like okay if i'm by myself i can see how that could be about right yeah. if i'm just explaining a, a, a training concept or um but if i have a guest on we're just kind of getting into it and i've been trying to keep a lot of them at around an hour and we've been going for quite a bit longer than that and that's fine yeah. and so now i think oh, it's just have the conversation go for as, as long as it wants to give the person plenty of time to express themselves and not um, have any kind of um, like I can think differently, which didn't really happen like in, in this time. But if someone else is like saying one thing and I think something different, but just to give them the space to think that, because of course there has to be that, like as soon as we, as soon as like things are moving, then we have duality. Yeah. You know, I can know those, moments of meditation or like the ultimate um, thing that we can get to is, yeah, we're all, we're all the same. Everything is the same. We're all part of the same God or Brahman or, or whatever. And as soon as you say Brahman up oh, Hindu, this, and then everything starts spinning out of control. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but speaking of uh, time, I do have to start getting going. I'm meeting some people at the, uh, at the Academy to, um, do some training in, in just a little bit uh is it you have uh i'm not in a real big hurry is there any like final like thoughts that you had you want to leave people with and how can people uh find your show and yeah um well it's been really nice talking to you first of all i've really enjoyed it um yeah the the podcast is true tales of enlightenment so you can find that on uh, itunes and uh, any of those podcasting sites uh, my website is uh, samwellsby.com, which is my name. So Wellsby spelled W-E-L-S-B-Y. And on there you can find all the podcasts. Um, there's also a resources page, which people might like. So um, if I'm talking about lots of different topics, I'll often reference different videos or books or stuff that I found on YouTube or, or whatever. Um, and in each of the emails that I send out with the podcast link, it's got all the resources. And so if you go onto the resources page, you'll just see hundreds of links on there. So if you want to explore any of the topics further that I talk about, then it just gives you the option to do that. And um, yeah, just, just, just take a look around. And you know, really what I'm trying to do with these podcasts is not, not just get all the stuff that's in my head out of my head. And hopefully that will help people, but just get people to start thinking a bit more and just sort of, you know, people talk a lot about expanding their consciousness and all that sort of stuff and for me that's really just increasing your awareness of like life and yourself so get curious about yourself and why you do the things you do and why you think the things you think and why you get triggered why you sabotage yourself what your values are what your good points are and just a little bit of self-examination is going to take you a long way so yeah that's that's me in a nutshell but thank you it's been really cool yeah thanks for being on and um i'm, I'm definitely gonna be listening to more of yours what i did here i, I really liked and 
um, it was good to have you on. You can come back on anytime. Yeah, and, that'd be good. Um, it's, it's really cool to be able to just kind of like whatever uh, pops up in the moment to kind of explore that and to push our like ways of uh, thinking and to be able to like say what we think, how to or like or figure out new um, territories to explore in, in the mind and and um, it, like the long form conversation. And it's like it was really like Joe Rogan who he's not following that your podcast should be twenty to forty minutes. He has people on for three hours. Exactly. And like an hour and a half is a short one for him. Yeah, totally. And uh, so I, I think that that's. Um, just kind of like proving like people are I'm like much more interested in like I might have a hard time like getting all the way through a movie without starting to like mess with my phone or something like that but conversations like that that we're having and that he has and uh, it, to me it's just a lot more interesting than uh, yeah. some script but uh, I will uh, let you go and I will uh, oh, I'll pause the recording and I'll talk to you for just a second after we're um, after I hit pause. Awesome. Yeah, thanks again for coming on. See you later.